So, I come home and I am short in the middle of an office renovation, so I have problems producing. And while I'm at it, well, I actually realized that a few videos about hypersonic weapons come out on YouTube. And in those videos, pretty much nobody even bothers to explain you why hypersonic weapons are such a technology challenge in the first place. But they all seem rather interested to push a narrative, which is probably what part of the public wants to hear. Well, I have to say we covered on this channel hypersonic weapons at least three years ago, and this is a mashup of that video series. But stay tuned because this is not the end about hypersonics, because this subject needs clarity. Enjoy. It's like flying into a blowtorch. In the years following the Second World War, at what was then the Muroc Airfield, which is known today as the Edwards Air Force Base, a group of visionary scientists and war-hardened military men started one of the great scientific quests of all time, the quest for speed. In its early stage, it culminated with the first famous supersonic flight by Chuck Yeager, and this is when the story usually stops. But the experimentation kept going, eventually becoming the saga of the X-Planes. The last of them, the X-15, was capable of reaching the Kármán line, 100 km of altitude, which is the conventional boundary between the atmosphere and the space. In 1967, Flight 188 also reached the high hypersonic speed of Mach 6.7, the world speed record for a piloted airplane. The record was set at the height of 31.3 km, where the air is thin and the pressure is low, and there was a good reason for going that high. The reason being that if you try to fly at that speed inside the dense part of the atmosphere, the friction with the air is so high that it develops blistering temperatures, like flying into a blowtorch. Welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. In this video, we are having an overview of the technological issues that rise when flying at high Mach number in the hypersonic domain. In this video, we set the scene for diving deep into the hypersonic flight science. Let's get going. The main problem of hypersonic flight is obviously heat, and hypersonic weapon may easily find itself operating around 2000 Kelvin. It is easy to understand how such a high temperatures are challenging for the material used to build the weapon. Some materials will simply melt, others will lose their structural properties and become too fragile to bear the loads of flight. The heat is produced by two basic mechanisms. First, the airflow slows down approaching the weapon, and the kinetic energy contained in the flow is turned into heat. This process is very complex, and it is also difficult to describe it intuitively, but heat happens for real. Second, the conditions of the hypersonic flow increase the effect of the fluid viscosity. Where there is viscosity, there is attrition. Where there is attrition, there also is energy dissipation, and the dissipated energy is turned into heat. Also, at the speed, heat and temperatures at which hypersonic weapons can operate, the radiation of heat becomes important, more important than convection, and it heavily influences the distribution of temperatures around the missile, creating very, very peculiar flight conditions. Everything that flies has to be stable and controllable. A missile is stable if, left with its own devices, with no external inputs, it doesn't deviate from the straight horizontal trajectory. It is controllable if, by doing something like moving an aerodynamic surface or orienting a nozzle, we can change the missile trajectory in a predictable way. 
Hypersonic weapons are often long and flat, sort of shaped like a surf table, because they need to generate lift, but they have little wiggle room to do so. The weapon should be contained, included within the bow shock to avoid a series of aerodynamic unwanted consequences, and at hypersonic speed, the shock angle is very narrow. The flat body can generate more lift than the cylindrical body of a missile, and it is accompanied by short and stubby aerodynamic surfaces, sometimes with a V-section. All of this needs to stay inside the shock, so the design is very peculiar and it is immediately recognizable. These particular flow conditions actually generated a new field of study derived from aerodynamics and called aerothermodynamics. With the temperatures involved in the hypersonic flight, it is natural that a sheet of plasma is forming around the weapon. Plasma can screen the weapon from radio waves, making radar guidance or data links very difficult to introduce. There are different approaches possible to overcome this issue, and it, indeed, it has been done. However, it is a further complexity in an already complex field. Hypersonic speeds are regularly achieved with rockets, but if we want to propel a hypersonic cruise missile, we need a specific type of propulsion, the scramjets. At low subsonic speed, propellers do just fine. From transonic to supersonic, turbojets have the most efficiency. From Mach 2 to Mach 4, roughly, runjets do their best, but if you want to achieve very high speeds, hypersonic speed, scramjets are your solution. The scramjet defining characteristic is that the flow within the engine never slows down below the speed of sound. Working scramjets are a relatively recent acquisition and their development required a number of technology breakthroughs in the era of high temperature aerodynamics and fuels. So, to understand hypersonic weapons, we have to understand a wide range of technologies, and it is no surprise that only the most advanced countries can build anything in this area. To understand hypersonic flight, we need to consider bow shocks, shock layer radiation, viscous interaction, shear layers, the chemistry of the flow field, boundary layer transitions, flow separation, recompression, and a lot of other stuff. So make yourself comfortable, because this time we have a lot to cover. Our thermodynamics is a hybrid branch where aerodynamics intersects thermodynamics. It is a complex field which is studied at university level and in real life it requires a lot of complex computer modeling to obtain a useful result. So I'm going to present an overview of the problems that happen at the hypersonic speed and make the flight so challenging and the weapons so hard to design. There is no real discontinuity in what happens if we increase the speed of flight from low subsonic to hypersonic. Mass and energy conservation still apply. Fundamental equations governing fluid motion and heat exchange are still the same. What changes is the relative importance of the effects at different speed. At low subsonic speed, the air behaves as if it was incompressible, like a liquid, and viscosity is of little importance. As we increase the speed, compressible effects start to appear, till when, around Mach 1, which is the speed of sound, shocks start to form in front of all the surfaces exposed to the free flow. While they seem very cool, shocks are only an obvious consequence of the fact that any disturbance in a fluid can't move at a speed faster than the speed of sound, which actually is a disturbance in itself. So, the flow upstream can't be influenced till the object is 
materially there and there must be an abrupt transition when the object arrives. If we accelerate at high supersonic speed, the aerodynamic heating becomes an important factor. Fighters of the 60s and the 70s were mostly capable of reaching Mach 2 and beyond, but when they flew at that speed for more than a few minutes, the heating was enough to strip the paint and damaged rivets of the leading edges. To make the SR-71 cruise at Mach 3, all sorts of measures had to be taken like using titanium, planning the thermal expansion of the metal panels or actively cooling some surfaces or running the fuel lines just behind them. The Soviets solved the problem by building the MiG-25 with steel, less prone than aluminum, to lose strength with the temperature. This is a school of thought that has some modern American supporters too. The problems are less important for air-to-air -air or surface-to-air missiles. They do fly up to Mach 4 and beyond, but they fly at that speed for a very short time, a matter of 20-30 seconds at most, while the whole flight may last a minute or so, so their materials do not need to resist for a very long time to high temperatures. If we accelerate even more, we enter the hypersonic domain, where heating becomes more and more important and a whole lot of interesting things start to happen. In front of an object flying at the high speed, there is always a shockwave that is a surface where temperature, pressure, density and speed change abruptly. In this process, a lump of air that crosses the shock is low down, potentially to a very, very slow speed. In fact, at the tip of every object, there is a very small region where the flow is basically stationary, which is called the stagnation point. In principle, it is where the temperature is the highest because the flow, slowing down, converts its kinetic energy into heat. The variation of temperature in Kelvin is proportional to the square of the Mach number and it can easily reach the thousands. For example, again, the SR-71, while cruising around Mach 3, reached external temperatures around 600 Kelvin. At the speed between Mach 8 and 10, which is the design speed of the hypersonic cruise missiles currently being in development, it might easily exceed 2000 Kelvin, and particularly low altitudes where higher density is still high. It is easy to understand that this is a big engineering problem. Luckily, there is something that we can do about it. As we have seen, the flow slows down through the shock. At the nose, there is a region of subsonic flow and since the air is moving slowly, it is the region where the temperature rises the most. The flow then speeds up again and becomes supersonic again, while moving toward the back of the vehicle. The outbound flow takes away the overheated air, so minimizing the size of the low speed region becomes a design goal. To do so, the most important parameter is the shock standoff distance. Intuitively, the more space you have between the shock and the body, the more room is available for the outbound flow. The shock standoff depends from the radius of the leading edge. The larger the radius, the larger the standoff. This is the reason why space vehicles enter the atmosphere presenting a flat surface to the flow. The shock is at maximum distance and the outflow of heat is at maximum too. Actually, the maximum flow of heat between the air and the vehicle is inversely proportional to the square root of the radius. So the larger the radius, the smaller the heat flow. Obviously, there are no free lunches because a flat body has also a lot of drag. A spacecraft entering the atmosphere has the objective of slowing down and landing safely, so a lot of drag is beneficial. An ICBM warhead has the objective while well, it actually has a very unlucky place as its objective and it wants to get there as fast as possible. This is the reason why there are conical and quite pointy ICBM re-entry vehicles. And hypersonic cruise missiles needs to fly and maneuver at hypersonic speed so a blunt nose is quite a severe performance penalty 
and it's not a viable solution. We will cover these aspects in detail in a future video. Blunt or pointy, you always want your body to be completely enveloped by the bow shock, whatever the shape and size of the shock may be. In the thin shock layer, there is an abrupt change of conditions and a lot of the fluid slowdown happens exactly there. So a lot of the heat is generated right inside the layer. The heating is at hypersonic level already and the shock layer literally radiates heat into the flow. If part of the vehicle, like an aerodynamic surface, is out of the bow shock, it means that the shock itself is impinging on it and the shock is actually touching the part roughly in the same position during the flight. Considering the temperatures involved, it is like having a blowtorch at work on the structure of the hypersonic vehicle, literally cutting through the metal. Secondary shocks originating inside the main shock where the fluid has accelerated and is going hypersonic again can do considerable damage too. It is famous the case of the last flight of the X-15 when some test equipment positioned near the tail of the plane generated secondary shocks uh, that cut into the structure and almost caused the loss of the plane. This is the reason why, because space vehicles enter the atmosphere with their large surface head-on, while hypersonic cruise missiles are thin and slender. Another element that makes an already complex field even more complicated is that at temperatures around 2000 Kelvin, oxygen starts dissociating. The O2 molecule is broken down into highly reactive and corrosive oxygen atoms. The good news is that part of the heat is used to break down the chemical bonds, reducing the temperature overall. The bad news is that the gas constants used to make the thermodynamic calculations start varying, making everything even more complex. Around this speed also plasma start forming, a small concentration but enough to have effects on the functioning of the apparatuses that emit or receive electromagnetic waves. These issues are not negligible for hypersonic cruise missiles, but hypersonic glider vehicles or space vehicles enter the atmosphere at speed two or three times faster, while well, they are even more severely affected. All these harsh thermal effects are challenging. The vehicle requires special materials and active cooling systems to survive. In the case of space vehicles, ablation material that sublimates away is extracting heat from the hottest regions is in use, uh, particularly for manned spacecrafts. Space planes usually have some sort of ceramic protection capable of withstanding the high temperatures. ICBM warheads use dense and heavy material as a heat shield. For example, depleted uranium is used to build the external cone even because, well, it improves the warhead yield. We know little about the hypersonic cruise missiles, but it can reasonably be assumed that they use ceramic in combination with some form of active cooling. Probably fuel is rooted in the areas that are exposed to the highest temperature, uh, obviously before burning it into the engine. Obviously, the introduction of all this energy in the aerodynamic field has consequences also for the way the air moves around the vehicle. Lift generation, stability, control, Hypersonic speed have their peculiarities that make the design of hypersonic planes and weapons immediately recognizable. If you are flying at hypersonic speed, the familiar aerodynamics governing the flight of planes doesn't apply straight away. Lift is generated by a different mechanism. Control requires special aerodynamic surfaces. The flow itself doesn't behave as you would expect. These are crucial differences that require the unmistakable design of hypersonic cruise missiles to make everything work properly.
The lift of an airfoil at subsonic or transonic speed is generated by the fact that the flow speed above the airfoil is higher than below, hence the pressure above the airfoil is smaller than the pressure below and the wing is sucked upward, producing lift. This starts to change at hypersonic speed and surprisingly, the lift generation mechanism is even easier than that. At hypersonic speed, the so-called Newtonian hypothesis is a very good approximation. Newton actually believed that the source of aerodynamic forces was due to particles of fluid hitting a body and transferring the momentum perpendicular to the surface to the body. In practice, every particle was supposed to bump into a body and the total effect of all combined bumps was the aerodynamic force, as if it was a sort of horizontal rain. At slow speed, this is not true, but surprisingly, at hypersonic speed, this is a very good approximation. The stream of particle impacts the portion of the body facing the flow, and we may assume that the rest of the body is in a sort of shadow and the pressure is near zero. The efficiency in producing lift is characterized by the use of a lift coefficient. At low speeds, the lift coefficient depends only from the angle of attack of the body. But at high supersonic and hypersonic speed, it depends also from the Mach number, and it tends to become smaller for the same angle of attack. If we consider the contribution of the lower and upper surfaces to the lift coefficient of the whole body, we can see that the lower surface dominates at hypersonic speed, which is actually in good agreement with the Newtonian hypothesis. You can immediately see that, if this is the case, a flat body works very well in generating the lift that may be needed with no need of wings with classic airfoil. The total lift being generated depends obviously from the speed and density of the air the weapon is traveling into, but the efficiency in generating lift depends roughly from the square of the sign of the angle between the flow and the local surface. But this is not the only element in play. There's also a pressure coefficient that measures how efficient is the fluid in applying pressure in a given point at a specific speed. It is high, and the pressure is high, where the fluid is low, like right after the bow shock and near the nose, and it decreases quickly while the fluid accelerates towards the back of the vehicle. This needs to be taken into consideration to design a missile that is stable in pitch. Obviously, more stubby vehicles like uh, hypersonic glider vehicles or space vehicles are less influenced by this problem, even if NASA actually got close to losing the first space shuttle during the re-entry for a similar problem. So, is there a way to understand why this simplified lift generation mechanism happens at hypersonic speed, but not at lower speed? To explain this intuitively, we can use an analogy. If someone is actually lobbing a pebble at you, the pebble is relatively slow and you have the time to react and get out of the way, hopefully. If someone is firing a bullet at you, it is so fast that you can't react. You are hit and thrown on the ground because all the bullet momentum has been dissipated inside you. No, sorry, this is creepy. This is really creepy. Who did write this? Me? Oh, suppose it's okay then? At hypersonic speed, the lumps of air are so fast that they go through the bow shock and impact the surface without changing direction too much. They are too fast for the rest of the aerodynamic field to exert any large influence on them, so they don't move in the relatively complex way, which is typical of the low speeds, where all the lumps of air have the time to heavily affect each other. Heavily affect each other. While the lift generation theory is simplified, 
At hypersonic speed they do exist what is called the hypersonic directional stability problem. Now, this is really hard to explain without equations, because the equations show a coefficient that becomes zero when Mach increases and stays zero if the Newtonian hypothesis is true. However, I try anyway. I am sure that many of you know that the stability of planes is assured by the tail aerodynamic surfaces. For example, the stability in Yo is assured by the vertical empennage. How this happens? Well, supposed to give a little bump to the plane such that it goes to starboard a bit. The flow on the vertical fin which moves with the whole plane changes. The angle of attack increases and with the angle of attack the fin starts generating lift. Since the fin is vertical the lift is directed sideways in a way that produces a torque that puts the plane straight. At hypersonic speed we already know that the lift coefficient that measures how good is anything in a flow at generating lift decreases with the Mach number. So a small deviation will change the flow on the vertical fin but the later lift produced will be very very small. A small force might easily end up not being enough to put the plane straight. At that speed, the deviation may, though, be enough to create other issues like aerodynamic shadows on the horizontal tail or parts of the plane actually intersecting the bow shock, which is as hot as a blowtorch and can damage the plane structure. This is the reason why hypersonic planes, the size, but also space rockets, often have fins with a triangular section. This generates more drag, but also generates a lateral lift. As long as the flow is parallel to the axis of symmetry, the lateral lift is the same on both sides. They balance each other. When the fin deviates, it, well, it is already producing a lift, which is high enough to set the plane straight again. For example, the vertical tail of the X-15 is actually a massive wedge. If you ever ask yourself why, well, this is the reason. The design of a hypersonic missile is a sort of minefield where the usual concepts of lower speed flow dynamics may be subverted and all sorts of these strange and counterintuitive situations like the one just described for the vertical fin may happen. So there would be plenty of other considerations to do, but I think that for today I have overheated your brain enough. Hypersonic cruise missiles are possible only because in the last decade, finally, a new type of engine has become viable. We are talking about the scramjet engine or in more cool, the supersonic combustion ramjet engine. I'm the Crow, welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. Since the end of the Second World War, the aeronautic research focused on achieving higher and higher speed. Supersonic speed was actually achieved shortly after the war, and it was believed that the trend was going to continue and hypersonic speed was going to be achieved in a few years. Unfortunately, this aspiration was trumped by a host of technical issues that have been finally resolved only in the last couple of decades. The scorching temperatures and the stability issues were problems, but nothing compared with the absence of an engine capable of operating reliably and consistently above Mach 5. Turbojets and turbofans, the most common type of aeronautic engines, are not very efficient beyond the transonic speed range, and the reason is quite intuitive. If the flow entering the compressor is transonic or supersonic, each compressor blade will start producing a maze of shocks and potentially flow separation and other issues. 
The shocks compromise the blade efficiency and waste the flow energy into heat. To avoid this, the air intakes would need to slow down the flow to a speed manageable for the compressor. This process is called recovering the pressure. But slowing down from hypersonic to subsonic would again waste an enormous amount of energy and increase the temperature at unmanageable levels. Beyond the speed of sound, the turbojet engine loses efficiency quite quickly and only the afterburner allows modern planes to reach speed between Mach 2 and Mach 3. Ramjets do better at high speed using a convergent intake to compress the air and recover the energy of the flow. They are also very attractive from the design and construction point of view because they are very simple, because they basically don't have any moving part. Problem is, the combustion of normal fuels need to happen at subsonic speed. If the speed in the combustion chamber increases too much, the flow may become faster than the speed at which the combustion propagates. So basically the flame is taken away downstream out of the combustion chamber. And to be honest, a slow and turbulent flow is exactly what you want because it mixes air and fuel much better the combustion efficiency is much better. So, if the flow needs to be subsonic in the combustion chamber, the problem of slowing down the flow too much is still there. So, between Mach 4 and Mach 5, the ramjet becomes basically inefficient. At the end of the day, the only hope of achieving sustained hypersonic speeds was to have an engine that didn't slow down the flow too much. To do so, the combustion must happen at supersonic speed. And believe me, you have to fix a lot of issues to do this. In its basic form, a scramjet has a converging air intake, a supersonic combustion chamber and a divergent nozzle. The convergent intake compresses the air doing the so-called pressure recovery, which helps the engine efficiency. An important design consideration for the intake is managing the shocks, the primary or secondary, that form near the intake in a way that doesn't interfere with the rest of the structure because the heating that happens at the shock acts as a blowtorch on the metal structure. Often, along the intake, there are secondary shocks starting at the leading edge bouncing off the walls, which are undesired because they dissipate energy and heat, uh, but in most cases they are unavoidable. Ahead of the combustion chamber is often found a section called the isolator. At low hypersonic speed, say Mach 5 to 8, the strong pressure gradient may cause flow detachment from the walls at the end of the intake and within the combustion chamber. This detached region becomes subsonic, so the disturbances generated in the combustion chamber then propagate upstream in the subsonic region and the overall effect is to create a train of shock waves that disrupt and reduce the efficiency of the converging intake. The isolator reduces this effect, avoiding the propagation towards the mouth of the intake. A particular strong combination of shocks in the intake might cause the flow in the combustion chamber to go subsonic, in a situation which is called choking. Given the energies in play, choking might severely damage the structure or even cause it to explode. Supersonic combustion in the combustion chamber poses a new series of problems. For example, the fuel injection mechanism must be such not to disrupt the flow too much because at supersonic speed any discontinuity may cause a shock wave and a loss of efficiency. The fuel is injected at a very high pressure by arrays of nozzles on the chamber walls creating a mesh of subtle jets that blend in the flow. The combustion itself needs to be very quick because it must at least match the speed of the flow in the combustion chamber. Common aromatic fuels like the JP7 might burn fast enough 
for the lower range of the hypersonic speed, but it is known that many different types of exotic hydrocarbons have been used to speed up the combustion. In some cases, even hydrogen has been tested as a possible fuel. Another technical solution to maintain a regular combustion in different conditions is to inject pyrophoric agents in the combustion chamber together with the fuel. An important design consideration is the fact that with the temperature increase in the combustion chamber, the Mach number decreases. This means that even if the flow inside the engine is still moving at a speed which would be supersonic outside, the conditions in the combustion chamber will be subsonic. This is a condition known as thermal choking and it is very dangerous because it might even cause the engine to explode. Scramjet technology is maturing just now, but it is not ready yet for the transport of humans or cargo, because the scramjet is in a delicate equilibrium that, once broken, can cause even destructive consequences. However, as a propulsion for and hypersonic cruise missiles, it is brilliant. Since it is destroyed with the rest of the weapon, the reliability must be in the order of the minutes. The relative simplicity of components make it probably cheaper than small turbojet used on cruise missiles. It can propel a beta immediately with not much efficiency. I personally believe that we are just seeing the beginning of this technology. So if you like this video, you may also like the videos beside me. In the meanwhile, please subscribe, hit the bell and consider supporting the channel on Patreon. For the moment being, thank you very much for watching and goodbye. I'm doing just one because I am basically lazy. Nothing on the left, nothing on the... Suffice to say that this engine... Ah, and they were all... Uh, blah. This is weird. Hypersonic speed also heavily reduces the effectiveness... Blah. I do for a reason, because if I do something like this, you know, when I'm editing, I see the blah, and it is clear that it's a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> it was full. <laughs> okay. Wrap up. For now, thank you very much for watching and goodbye.